Hey guys, welcome out to Revolution this morning. Uh, we're going to be looking at Philippians chapter 2 verse 6 this morning. And so in the King James it reads, Who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. And so uh, we can see this is pretty much the consistent reading throughout most um, Texas Receptus editions. Um, we see in the Bishop's Bible of 1568, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with, with God. Uh, the 1560 Geneva Bible, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Um, the 1526 uh, Tyndale, um, which being in the shape of God, and thought it not robbery to be equal with God. So we see that um, most Reformation Bibles, TR Bibles, have the same reading there. So what do we see in the modern version? So <clears throat> uh, from what I can understand, uh, the 1881 or the 1885 revised version um, basically followed the King James. When we hit the 1901 American Standard Version, we see it says, Who, existing in the form of God, counted not the, the being on an equality with God, a thing to be grasped. I know they're saying, oh, it sounds, it's so much easier than the King James. Um, who being in the form of God, counted not the being on an equality with God, a thing to be grasped. So that's the 1901. So let's look at the uh, Amplified Bible. Who, although being essentially one with God and in the form of God, and in brackets, possessing the fullness of the attributes which make God God, close brackets, did not think this equality with God was a thing to be eagerly grasped or retained. The CEB Bible says, though he was in the form of God, he did not consider being equal with God something to exploit. The CSB says, who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. The ERV says he was like God in every way, but he did not think that his being equal with God was something to use for his own benefit. <clears throat> the ESV says who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Um, the Holman Christian Standard Bible, who existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage, the NASB, um, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. And so that we'll see that in most of these versions. It says that um, he did not consider or did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. And so that's usually what's said. Uh, I'll just read a few more. <clears throat> uh, the NCV um, half, the, half of these acronyms, I have no idea what they are, but um, the Christ himself, would, there's just so many English Bibles. There's just, just thousands and thousands of English Bibles. Um, well, not thousands and thousands. There's about a thousand English Bibles. And so um, hundreds and hundreds, I should say. Uh, Christ himself was like God in everything, but he did not think that being equal with God was something to be used for his own benefit. The NET, that's the Dan Wallace's Net Bible, um, who, though he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped. So if we were to talk to people who are on the, um, the critical text side, usually they would, they would follow the NET. Now, a lot of people um, would quote the NET, atheists, people who usually come against Scripture and say the Scriptures have mistakes, Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, Muslims, um, perhaps Mormons, they would use the NET because they believe that Dan Wallace is an authority in the field, a bit like a Bart Ehrman type of guy. And they use the NET uh, basically saying that that's the definitive uh, translation that a lot of people respect Dan Wallace. And so they would use that. Um, the NIRV, so this is the New International Revised Version, in his very nature, he was God, but he did not think that being equal with God was something he should hold on to. Uh, the NIV, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. The NLT, 
though he was God, he did not think equality with God as something to be, uh, something to cling to. <clears throat> the Revised Standard Version, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Um, the New American Bible Roman Catholic Edition, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped. That's pretty much the same. And so, um, so what's the difference here? So um, I just want to read two versions here. And most of this uh, video, I'll just be dealing with the New American Standard Bible because that's, that's uh, considered the most literal Bible um, by mo in modern standards, uh, even though the, there's lots of places where it's not literal. Um, but this just, just seems to have that common reading. It, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. And that's in quite a lot of the modern versions. So the King James says, who, so talking about Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Okay, so Jesus didn't think it robbery to be equal with God. He didn't, when he claimed to be deity, when he claimed to be God, he wasn't, he wasn't robbing God of anything. He was God. He's Jehovah the Son. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are Jehovah. Jehovah the Father, Jehovah the Son, and Jehovah the Holy Spirit. So when we look at the New American Standard Bible, we see who, although he existed in the form of God, okay, that's fine, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. And so I'm going to explain exactly what this means. So um, imagine if I just got these these words here and I just put it into a modern context. Now, we, we all know that in the United States, um, they're having, I would call them fake race uh, race wars, you know, where people are, are talking about you know, Black Lives Matter and all the rest of it. Now, I've been following this for quite a long time. I do understand that there are issues with um, people who are black. Like a lot of people will say that there is no... Uh, white privilege and all the rest of it. I, I thoroughly believe that there is, um, not because I'm persuaded by the left, but just because I've visited so many black countries and um, I get treated very different being a white person in a black country. Um, when I've been to Papua New Guinea, I've been there 13 times. I get treated very differently. That if I go to in, walk into a bank, they will put me at the front of the line <laughs> in front of maybe 100 people. And just, just because I'm white. And so there is a thing called white privilege. And this is one of the things. We're looking at the American narrative. We're going to put that in, into perspective of the rest of the world. And that doesn't mean that's the same everywhere. In some places, white people get disrespected. And so um, th that's just the way life is. And we can't just put American standards upon us. Um, we've got to uh, evaluate every country is different. Every people group is different. Um, and everyone has what would be deemed racism. All racism is is just someone looks a bit different and we point it out. That's what basically racism is. And so um, by people saying that there is a thing called white privilege in a sense where, you know, say in Australia or America, or if you go for a job because you're white or because you're black or because you're Asian or whatever, um, that's going to make a huge difference. Perhaps it might. Um, but not always, and you can't always label people with the same brush because some people have had um, very hard lives. They've grown up um, in ghettos. They've grown up in situations where um, they understand that it's when they go for a job, when they go for a house, when they go to school, it's the color of their skin does make a big difference. But that can also be reversed, and um, you know we we know that with uh, many different cultures um, and. So, but one of the things that I wanted to bring up here was, imagine if I said the black man, so talking about the American slavery, etc., the black man or someone like Martin Luther, he thought it not robbery to be equal with the white man. Okay, so that means that he understood that he is just as much a man as a white man. We're equal. There's no difference between us. The black man thought it not robbery to be equal with the white man. That's sort of roughly what the King James Version is saying about, you know, Jesus didn't consider it robbery to be equal with God. You know, he's God. He, it's not ro He's not robbing anything from God to say, hey, I'm God. He can just say that whenever he wants. But listen to the NASB when I put this modern example there. 
the black man did not regard equality with the white man a thing to be grasped. So he's looking at the white man saying, I, I, don't, I don't want what he has. And, you know, obviously we're talking in this American context, say, maybe in the 1950s and 60s when, you know, segregation was still there in the United States. And, but um, these are totally different concepts. And so uh, corrupt modern Bibles are not only inaccurate here, but have followed the exact opposite meaning to the Greek and to the King James Version, which faithfully follows the Greek. The Greek behind the King James Version and the Corrupted Bibles here is exactly the same. So this examination will show you how flawed the modern corrupt uh, versions are and how illiterate their translators are. Those who translate this verse are either illiterate in the Greek language or they have heretical Arian type views concerning the Godhead of Jesus um, as it completely mutilates doctrine. And so one of the things is usually um, I deal with differences between the underlying Greek text. So this is the Texas Receptus. This is the text that the King James translators, they did the King James Bible. Now, they mostly used the, the Greek underlying, um, or the Greek underlying this was mostly the, the text of Theodore Beza, the 1598. Now, Scrivener, he created this text, and in the preface, he says that he mostly uses the 1598, um, but there's a few places where he amended the Greek to match this. So basically, this is the underlying Greek text of this. Now, Scrivener did a pretty good job. There's a few tiny little places here and there where I would say, well, I wouldn't word it that way. I'd word it differently, but he did a very, very good job. I mean, you're looking at, most people don't even know the differences between you know this and the King James, or even the 1598, or differences between TR editions. And so when, when I'm usually doing videos, I'm usually comparing um, this Greek text with the modern Greek text. So the one that came out in 1881 uh, by Westcott and Hort. And so Westcott and Hort, they hated the Texas Receptors. They hated the King James Version. And so they created their own Greek text based on different manuscripts and um, Basically, they, they created a never seen before. I call it the Frankenstein text, where they have the, the Vaticanus, uh, Codex Vaticanus and Codex Sinaiticus. They got these two, which differ um, hugely. They shouldn't even be called the same text family, but they tried to amalgamate these two. A lot of the time, they're just siding with Vaticanus, which was rejected by Erasmus, rejected by John Mill, um, rejected by basically the whole entire Reformation. But it's been resurrected in, in these days and Unitarians who despise the Trinity and they hate the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, they use this text and Jehovah's Witnesses, they use this text. Roman Catholics, they use this text and most of the modern Bibles today use this text unless it's like the New King James or the modern English version um, that, that says that they use the Texas Receptus. And so... Sometimes um, I'm just dealing with those Greek issues, but a lot of the time it's actually how words have been defined. Because you can you can faithfully translate this text or faithfully translate the other Greek text, and you'll get certain differences everywhere. But a, a lot of the time there is no difference in the Greek, and what we're talking about in Philippians chapter two verse six, there is no difference. Uh, it doesn't matter which Greek edition you look at. There's no difference uh, between them. So this is purely to do with um, the translator's understanding of how to translate uh, and also how they define words. And so what I find is, um, say, like the strongest concordance, which a lot of Christians would have. They'll have the King James in one hand and they'll have the strongest concordance in the other. And strong, uh, many times, um, I'm pretty sure he was on the 1901 American Standard Version Committee. Now, um, there were Unitarians on that committee as well, same as the Westcott and Hort Translation Committee. They had Unitarians, George Vance Smith. He was a Unitarian. If you just look up George Vance Smith, Unitarian, Westcott and Hort, you'll find information. I've got videos on YouTube about him. And it just, it's just amazing that people will, they, they just seem to forget these guys in history. This guy wrote a book saying that he's, that the version of Westcott and Hort changes doctrine. Now, one of the, the cries today is, oh, no Bible, no modern Bible version changes doctrine. 
we're going to see just by going through this that not only do they change doctrine, but there doesn't even have to be a difference in the underlying Greek text. It can just be the way it's translated into English. <clears throat> and so uh, corrupted modern Bibles, and when I say corrupted modern Bibles, not every part of a modern Bible is corrupted. Uh, some of them, they just take out, like I said, the, the Greek. Some of them, because the difference between the Texas Receptus Greek and the modern Greek, you're looking at 2,900 less words in the modern uh, modern Greek, and you're looking at about 8,000 changes. So that's quite a lot of words missing, and it's quite a lot of words changed. And so um, what that can cause a lot of problems just in itself. But then you've got the added problem, like I'm going to talk about, of just how it's been translated. So corrupt and modern Bibles state that Jesus uh, did not seek or grasp equality with God. Um, but the abundant testimony is clear that Jesus did, in fact, grasp for equality with God. And he said so on many occasions. So it's not just the Texas Receptus and the King James Version that opposes modern corrupt Bibles here, but just the plain testimony of Jesus' life, just the Gospels show that Jesus himself did the exact opposite of what the corrupt modern Bibles are saying that, um, that's true here. And so um, John Gill, he noted the same thing. So I'm just going to read this commentary of John Gill. As for the sense which some put upon the words, as he did not affect or greedily catch at deity, as the phrase will not admit of it, so it is not true in fact. He did affect deity, and asserting it strongly, and took every proper opportunity of declaring it and in express terms affirm that he was the son of God, and in terms easy to be understood, declared his proper deity and his unity and equality with the Father, required the same faith in himself as in the Father, and signified that he was one, uh, sorry, that when you saw the one, you saw the other. And so John Gill's basically saying the exact opposite of what the New American Standard Bible is saying. He's, he's saying that Jesus often would declare that he was God. He would say that he was God. And so um, it's quite strange, the contradictory nature that we see. And sometimes when I'm watching apologists, they're, they're trying to prove to you know Jehovah's Witnesses or to Muslims or whatever that Jesus is God from the Gospels. I'm like, well, what about this verse where it says that he didn't consider equality with God, something to be grasped. But look, you've created a contradiction in your modern Bibles here. And so let's go back to someone like John Chrysostom. So John Chrysostom, he was born in 345 and he lived to about 405. So he was a native Greek. His mother tongue was Greek. Uh, so everyone agrees with that. <clears throat> and so he was in agreement with the King James Version reading. And so he came against the Arian. So I'm going to show you that the New American Standard Bible here has an Arian reading in it. So Arians are basically like um, Jehovah's Witnesses, but they lived around this time, around you know, 300 to 400 AD. And so let's just see what Chrysostom says, says here. What shall we say against Arius, who asserts the sun is of a different substance. Tell me now, what means he took the form of a servant? It means he became man. Wherefore, being in the form of God, he was God. For one form and another form is named. If the one be true, the other is, is also. The form of a servant means man by nature. Wherefore, the form of God means God by nature. And he not only bears record of this, but of his equality too, as John also doth, that he is in no way inferior to the Father. For he says, he thought it not a thing to seize, to be equal with God. Now, what is their wise reasoning? Nay, they say, 
he proves the very contrary. For he says that being in the form of God, he sees not equality with God. John Chrysostom. And so basically John Chrysostom is saying, okay, he explains the verse as we would understand it, uh, reading from the King James Version, Texas Receptus. Um, and how a, you know, a Trinitarian would understand it, how someone who believes in the deity of Christ would understand it. But then he says the Arians who don't believe in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, they don't believe in the Trinity, um, they don't believe in the unity of the Godhead, that they would say pretty much the exact opposite, that being in the form of God, he sees not equality with God or he didn't see equality with God something to grasp or to, or to seize or and so that's in John Chrysostom homily 6 Philippians uh, chapter 2 verses 5 to 8 so historically had the Arians attempted to deny the deity of Jesus Christ um, so sorry so historically um, the Arians attempted to deny the deity of Jesus Christ with the very same words that appear in these corrupt modern Bibles. So Chrysostom, he's a fluent Greek speaker. Um, so he's defending basically the Texas Receptus reading here by what he says. So native Greeks who are fluent in English also agree with the King James Version. So Arian concepts have also crept into the modern corrupt Bibles uh, such as in John chapter 1, verse 18, where we have the only begotten God instead of the only begotten Son. Um, and we've recently seen uh, this even through um, Georgios Babiniotis, um, who's probably one of the greatest living Greek linguists of our age. So his claims are simply ignored or dismissed in a knee-jerk reaction to den deny the Comi Johannium. Um, and so I contacted um, uh, Georgios Babiniotis and I asked him about 1 John 5, 7. He said it should be there because of the grammar. And so he agreed with Eugenius Vulgaris. Uh, he agreed with many, many other scholars about the grammar in this verse. And so instead of uh, modern day scholars examining that and looking at that and saying, wow, this guy is like the leading Greek expert, um, they just completely dismiss that and they say, you know, what's this, who is this guy sort of thing? You know, this guy's like written seven dictionaries. You know, he's, he's an expert in every form of Greek, Koine Greek, ancient Greek, um, modern Greek. He's, he's an expert. He was, um, yeah, he was the main rector at, um, at Athens University. You know, this, this guy knows his stuff and they just dismiss him in a knee-jerk reaction. They're just like, who is this guy? Uh, you know, and so... Um, they blindly defend those who are, are functionally incompetent in translation. So if you read and defend modern um, Bibles that have corruptions in them, you are reading and defending ancient heresies of Arians and, and Gnostics throughout the New Testament. Um, so the anti Texas Receptus, anti-King James Version crowd. So you can get people who are anti-Texas Receptus, they're anti the Greek, but there are people who are, they can actually hold to the Greek, but they're actually anti-King James. And so I, I don't understand why they would do that. Um, but many times people are just, they just want to come against the King James Version. They understand that it's, um, that it's a standard. They understand it's still a standard. In most places, it is still a standard. Name the modern version that is the standard. You can't. New American Standard Bible, ESV. I just picked one at New American Standard Bible just because in this particular case, it's got you know, the majority of those readings. But a lot of the time, they're all over the place. They all have different readings. So the anti-TR, King James Version crowd, cannot refute the actual evidence that uh, Georgios Babiniotis brought forth. And when they try to, they demonstrate complete incompetence in the basics of the Greek language and of biblical translation. Anyone arrogant enough to dismiss what Babiniotis said by casually dismissing his claims knows nothing of the Greek language. Nothing of the Greek language. This is the world leading expert. If I got the world leading expert, you know, the, the David Crystal types, the... If I got world leading expert in, in Arabic and you want to 
debate people about the Quran. I think you should listen to these people. You know, um, we're talking about the world leading experts here. We're not just talking about some some back block. Guy. We're talking about a guy who's written a ton of dictionaries. Um, and so he's written books on etymology. He's written books on ancient Greek literature. He, This guy, um, I think it's estimated to have, um, don't quote me on this, but uh, about 200 books written. So this guy, this guy is legendary. So when I contacted him, I asked him basic, simple questions, and he agreed with what I was saying, and he added to that. And when I showed James White, when I showed um, Stephen Boyce, when I showed James Snap Jr., when I showed um, Barry Hofstad, these guys, they didn't want anything to do with it. They just, who is this guy? You know, <laughs> he's the leading Greek expert in the world who knows and understands the Greek grammar, the Greek syntax, and so that's the thing. It doesn't seem to matter how far you go with digging up evidence. For some people, their bias against the King James Bible, their bias against just truth, just, just you know, how can you argue against that? How can you argue against the world leading expert, you know, saying that there's a grammatical error in the modern Bibles? If you take 1 John 5, 7 out, there's a solecism there. And so, but if you put it in, it corrects the solecism. It's very clear. And so, um, anyway, so I showed this to a group of people and they were just like, no, no, no. And they just overlooked it. Now, who is this guy? They, they have no idea who Babaniotis is. So we're dealing with people who flirt with heretical readings all the time. And so that they're, they're on, on the fence. They don't mind. It's sort of like, oh, only begotten son or only begotten God. Uh, it's you know, um, and it's quite amazing. And you know, one of the uh, things that struck me as I was actually writing this article, many times now this this isn't um, a debated verse in uh, in a sense where the Greek is not debated here. It's only the way it's been transmitted. But any debated verse is usually frowned upon. Um, to be preached from the pulpit. So if you go through, say, Dallas Theological Seminary, that they, they, they will so, keep saying cemetery, uh, seminary, they will uh, basically tell you not to preach on verses where there's variance, where there's you know textual variance. But the funny thing is, when they have these textual variants like this, like you know, um, in John chapter one verse eighteen, the only begotten God, James White uses it all the time. He brings it up all the time and only begotten God it's it's because usually the King James Bible is very strong on the deity of Christ and on the Trinity and these other versions they because the Bible Society became the Unitarian Bible Society basically when the Trinitarians left in 1831 and formed the Trinitarian Bible Society which still to this day prints the King James because it's the Trinitarian Bible the Unitarians basically had taken over the, the Bible Society. That's, that's why you see 1 John 5, 7 taken out. That's why you see God was manifest in the flesh. Oh, no, it's he appeared in a body. Well, who's he? You know, it's, it said God before, but why is it like that? And so you see all these types of changes happening in the Greek, but they usually say you shouldn't preach on any debated verse. If there's debate about, about these verses, don't preach it from the pulpit. So that's why a lot of people don't actually look into these verses because they've never really heard them. Now, this verse in particular, you people have heard of because there isn't a variant here, but there is a uh, a mess in how it's been translated from the Greek. So we're going to look into that. So we're, we're talking about people who favour rare and bizarre texts with huge genealogical and geographical errors. You have Jesus going to the wrong city. You have a swine marathon where the pigs have gone all of a sudden a thousand miles in the other direction. Um, you have grammatical solecism. Solecisms are when the grammar just doesn't simply match, match up. A you know, basic example would be an apple or a apple. You know, we know there's a gr grammatical error there. So when you see the critical text is filled with these errors, but the Texas Receptus doesn't have those errors. It doesn't have those solecisms in it. And so um, people who are fluent in Greek, they look at, look at the modern text and they say, it's, got, it's filled with grammatical errors, uh, filled with solecisms. 
philological and orthographical blunders. So we see this all the way through these modern Bibles. Not all modern Bibles, but the corrupted modern Bibles. <clears throat> so to have these folks defend the mutilation of Philippians chapter 2, verse 6, with a verse that is close to the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit here is not surprising. I'm going to show you that this verse is actually blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Now, if you think that I'm just saying this just to be, you know, scaremongering or whatever, just, just stick with me, go through this. We'll see <laughs> who, which version is correct here. Okay, so... Um, but it's actually remarkable to watch as the Aryan Kool-Aid is served up among those uh, who desperately claim that that their orthodox apologetic outweighs uh, their complete disobedience to Scripture, especially Revelation chapter 22, verse 19. Now, all the way through the Bible, it says, don't add to my word, don't take away from my word, don't mutilate my word. Um, and so yeah, right at the end of the Bible, it says, don't add to, to my words, or your name will be taken out of the book of life. Now, if it said there, don't fornicate, or your name will be taken, people will be like, hey, don't fornicate, don't. They'd be warning people. But it says, don't add to or take away from the Bible. Do you ever really hear that preached? <laughs> it's in the Bible. Uh, and this is one of the things, that, because modern churches have been so dumbed down to, to think that if you have one truth, if you have one truth, that's weird. But if you have multiple truths, that's fine. Even contradictory truths, that's fine. And so no wonder people are confused. The Greek word for robbery, apagmos, uh, in the Greek text of Philippians chapter 2, verse 6, is a noun. So the King James Version um, basically used the word robbery, which is another noun. So it's translated a noun into a noun. So the corrupted modern Bibles changed the Greek noun into a verb to be grasped. So this is just some of the basics, okay? So uh, instead of translating uh, into another noun, and, um, you know, I understand, and you know, li a literal translation sometimes doesn't always work, but um, most of the time it does. And so here we see that it should. It's translated um, from a noun into a verb in the New American Standard Bible. And they say that's you know one of the most um, most accurate, but I I doubt that just you know, just with the evidence I've got. So even on a basic cursory look, the King James version follows the Greek syntax exactly, while corrupt modern Bibles um, alter the syntax entirely. Okay, so then we look for the word equal. So the word equal is. Isos, which is an adverb. Although some grammarians treat this word as an adjective, it's irrelevant for our demonstration here. But the Greek word isos in the King James Version is also an adverb equal. Okay, so it's basically exactly word for word. You know, he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. So um, the corrupted modern Bibles change this Greek adverb into a noun that is equality. Well, the King James Version follows the Greek tax, Greek syntax exactly. So um, the corrupt Bibles alter the syntax entirely. So we can see just in the Greek that it's basic schoolboy Greek that they've they've gone through this and they haven't translated it faithfully. They haven't gone verb for verb, noun for noun. They, they've they've changed these words. Um, Modern English-speaking Bible scholars who don't speak Greek, who have watched things like the Credo Course with Dan Wallace, love to assert that the order of Greek has no force whatsoever. But native Greek speakers state the exact opposite. The word order in Greek can often have great significance. The word order in our passage is verification of this, along with the non-literal renderings of corrupt modern versions. Any native Greek who is fluent in English will testify that this verse in the King James Version is accurate. I mean, we see that throughout the Reformation from you know, Tyndale all the way up to the King James. It's pretty much exactly the same reading. It's been the same reading right up even the Westcott and Hort 
Bible, English Bible, the Revised Version, was the same. But then we see the American Standard Version, um, which had Unitarians working on it as well. Uh, then it's changed. And so uh, this verse, uh, sorry, any native Greek who is fluent in English will testify that this verse in the King James Version is accurate and that this verse uh, in modern corrupted Bibles is completely inaccurate. Only those with the bias against the King James Version would defend this verse in corrupt modern Bibles to be grasped. So these words are not found in any manuscripts to be grasped. It just it doesn't equate. You, 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 if you were to show those words to someone who, who is fluent in Greek and can, and can translate it into English, they would just that they would say hey, that doesn't appear in the text. Um, so it seems to be added between 1881 and 1901. And so listen to what Jesus said. Okay, all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. Now that's just one verse. I'm going to read through a few verses here. <laughs> that just totally contradicts the New American Standard Version. Totally contradicts it. <laughs> Jesus didn't consider um, you know, it robbery to be equal with God, you know, because he was God. That's what the King James says. But Jesus did not consider, hang on, I've got to get the correct reading there. Jesus did not consider um, equality with God a thing to be grasped. Okay, so Jesus wasn't going around saying, I'm, hey, I'm God. You know, he wasn't going around um, making these type of claims. Uh, but let's just, just look at some other things Jesus said. So let me just read that again. All men should honor, honor the Son. So this is Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world speaking. All men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. Is he making himself equal with God here? Yeah. Well, but doesn't that verse say he didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped? Isn't that a contradiction? It gets worse. Jesus had absolutely no problem whatsoever grasping equality with God. And the Bibles and the scholars who say that he did are, are just liars like Arius was. It is the exact opposite of God's truth. So John Chrysostom noted, referring to the um, Arius and pagan philosophy, he stated, no, say they, but he means that being a little God, he sees not upon being equal to the great God who was greater than he. Is there a great and little God? And do ye bring in doctrines of the Greeks upon those of the church. So as plain as anyone can see, John Chrysostom, <clears throat> who lived between 345 and 405, so who was a Greek, whose mother tongue was Greek, he's explaining what it means. He's explaining what Arius thinks it means. Then he's explaining what it truly means. Um, he tied the wording of the corrupt modern Bibles to the heretic Arius and pagan philosophy. So the first time we hear the term blasphemy against the Holy Ghost in Scripture is when Jesus confronts the Pharisees for their wickedness in Matthew chapter 12, verse 31. Jesus had just freed a person bound by Satan who was possessed with the devil, both blind and dumb. The Pharisees, instead of praising God, accused Jesus of receiving his power from Beelzebub, the prince of the de devils. Jesus said they were in danger of blaspheming the Holy Ghost. Jesus later said to them, But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give it account, therefore on the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words shalt thou be condemned. Now, the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost in the King James at times cannot occur apart from a deliberate, calculated, premeditated denigration of the person of Jesus Christ. It's not just this the mistake. You know, people, some people are like, oh, I blaspheme the Holy Ghost. And, <clears throat> um, 
there is, you know, people coming against Christ, you know. You see, it is one thing to speak um, a word against the Son of Man. It is another thing entirely to despise him and count his blood an unholy thing. It is one thing to take the Lord aside and to rebuke him over a theological issue or deny him in the face of trial, as Peter did. It is another thing entirely to behold infinite righteousness, infinite holiness, and infinite light, which can be perceived in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone, and then to despise it and to disparage it and to call righteousness evil, uh, to see pure holiness as profane and to exchange pure light for darkness. That is for pride's sake to embrace the very soul of wickedness in himself as Jesus Iscariot, Judas Iscariot did. This is treading underfoot the, the Son of God. This is counting the blood an unholy thing. It is doing despite unto the Spirit of grace. In short, this is the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, and it cannot occur apart from a willful denigration of the person of Jesus Christ. Okay, so that sort of gives us a bit of an idea of what the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is. Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 in the corrupt modern Bible versions arrogantly enters this domain and their transgression. So I'm going to explain how um, it becomes a blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. In the 10th chapter of the Gospel of John, we find the Lord Jesus once again surrounded by a pack of rabid Pharisees. Completely unsatisfied with all the Lord has done for, you know, so far, he's healed the lepers, he's given sight to the blind, strength to the lame, hearing to the deaf, voice to the dumb, life to the dead, and much more besides. Those religious wolves now declare that such evidence is not enough for him to be the Christ. They want more. If you are the Christ, tell us plainly, they would say. <laughs> it's like, just look at my works. Look what I've been doing. Just tell us, you know. They, they always want more, just that little bit more. Jesus answered them, I told you and you believed not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. And after expanding a bit, the Lord then closes his exposition in verse 30 by announcing, I and my Father are one. Okay, so there's like, you know, just tell us if you're the Christ. You know, he's like, I and my Father are one. So this was the last straw. The Pharisees took up stones. Jesus said, many good works I have showed you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? The Pharisees responded by saying, for a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God, the exact opposite of what the New American Standard Bible says <laughs> that Jesus was doing. He didn't consider it, you know, um, something to be grasped. To <laughs> And so we're seeing he's doing the exact opposite. So just like the King James Version's translation in Philippians chapter 2, verse 6. Um, so in other words, the Pharisees were offended with the concept presented in what we have today in the King James Version. In fact, earlier in the same gospel, they used almost identical wording in their scorn and accusation against him. Therefore, the Jews sought the more to kill him because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but he also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. So again, so that's in John chapter 5, verse 18. When you read through the Gospel of John, Jesus is saying, I am God, I am God, all the way through. Jesus knew what he was doing. So we're going to come to the heart of the matter right here. And I want you to listen very carefully to this. Jesus knew what he was doing. And Jesus knew that he was driving this to a conclusion where they would crucify him for saying that he is God. He had purposely declared himself as God. It wasn't a slip of the tongue. It wasn't just something that he didn't really want to show anyone, but then all of a sudden he did. Um, and, you know, he didn't know anything about it. And, you know, then he's got all this scorn and this, the Sanhedrin are against him and all that. Um, he knew what he was doing. So the real reason that the Pharisees were upset with Jesus was because of who he actually was. Because they hate God. 
because they hate Jesus. They had no problem with his works. It was himself they hated. It wasn't so much his teaching, but him. And now on top of, the, top of it all, he had the audacity to make himself right there in front of them, right there before their very eyes, equal with God. He, Jesus himself, made himself equal with God. And so that he's just done that boldly in front of them. I'm God. And so, um, but the thing is, I listen to apologists and so I was listening to Samuel um, Nissan the other day, and he was he was doing a very good job, I thought, um, on expounding um, Jesus being God in the Gospels. But he follows these modern Bibles. How can he read this verse and claim this verse when everything he's trying to prove is against this verse? So anyway, we'll just stick to what I'm saying here. As the Scriptures make it abundantly clear, Jesus' words and actions diametrically contradict the corrupt modern Bibles. Diametrically, as does the Greek, as we saw before in the functional incompetence in biblical translation by the translators of most corrupted modern Bibles. Jesus Christ not only had no problem grasping equality with God, he boldly, blatantly asserted it. Jesus Christ boldly, blatantly asserted that he was equal with God. So this is the exact opposite of what most modern Bibles are falsely claiming in Philippians chapter 2, verse 6. And thus, the genuinely born-again Christian, uh, you don't even have to go to the Greek here. You know, the Greek is exactly the same. You don't, you don't really even have to match up the Greek, you know, okay, does this Greek match up with the English? And you know, I, I prove that it, it matches up with the King James. All you have to do is look at Jesus' life. And you see that he is constantly saying that he's God. So this creates a contradiction. When I'm street preaching and people come up to me looking in my eyes to see if I'm lying... And they say, does the Bible have any contradictions? I say, I, I've never found one. And if there is a, a contradiction in there, I've never seen it. I don't know about it. And I can honestly look them in the eye and say that. And someone who's reading ESV, someone who's reading the New American Standard Bible, someone who's reading these modern ver versions, if you know this information, you can't say that. Because it's a, it's a contradiction. That's why... When half the time when I'm debating people about the Bible issue, they say, ah, all Bibles have mistakes in them. I just go to the Greek and that's it. So, okay, so none of the Bibles are accurate. So no Bible can be translated accurately. And this is one of the strange things. Like um, I had some friends in uh, Byron Bay and they were um, translating Luxembourgish. They were working for the EU and they're translating all the EU documents into Luxembourgish. I said to them, so do you ever have problems with translating, you know, like you're talking about nuclear weapons and you're talking about the economy and all sorts of different hard topics. Do you have a problem with translating? You know, can you always bring things across, say from English or German or whatever the language is, into your language? And they said, yeah, we never have a problem because they're fluent. <laughs> fluent Bible translators won't have a problem. The guys with the King James Bible, they were fluent. They didn't have a problem. The modern version translators have a problem. And they just so happen to agree with Arius on this. <clears throat> and so the modern versions create a contradiction here. Contrary to the ignorant and blasphemous assertion of the corrupted Bibles, Jesus had no problem with his divinity whatsoever. Jesus had no problem grasping equality with God. No problem whatsoever. Jesus actually asserted his equality with God boldly and without apology. As the King James Version correctly renders it, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, and he said so blatantly. So corrupted uh, Bibles... <coughs> present a doctrine in Philippians chapter six, uh, 2, verse 6, just as they do in John chapter 1, verse 18. So they, they basically have created a new doctrine. 
And so, and it comes from Gnostic readings. It comes from Arian readings. Um, so to the Pharisees, Jesus' words were blasphemy. Okay, so Jesus saying this, it was blasphemy. Jesus knew that they would consider it blasphemy because you know Jesus had boldly and confidently and without apology asserted that he was equal with God. Okay, there's no mistaking it. As his accusers reminded him, thou, being a man, makest thyself God. Okay, so that's exactly what Jesus didn't say. Oh, no, you got me wrong here. You know, I'm not saying that at all. That's what he was doing. <laughs> and they understood it. And they hated him for it. So why did they hate him? Because where Jesus Christ was concerned, the Pharisees did not believe that he had any right to consider equality with God something to be grasped. <laughs> <laughs> they were reading the New American Standard Bible. <laughs> they, they were practicing exactly what the New American Standard Bible says. It's, isn't this bizarre? Okay, but it gets worse. I'm just going to show you. So it's just like these modern Bibles say, that's exactly what their mindset was. That Jesus, you shouldn't be grasping for this. <laughs> and uh, how strange is it? How, how confused must the modern Christian be who you know, gets a Bible and they're like, they look, jump on the internet, they find James White, Dan Wallace, Mark Ward, they find all these guys and they grab a New American Standard Bible and they're told it's the bee's knees. They read this verse and then they read, <laughs> it says, you know, he didn't consider it something to be grasped. Equality with God. He didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped. But then you read the Gospels and he did. Where are you going to go with that? <laughs> it's like, um, it, to me, this is amazing. And it's just amazing. Like, you know, how strange this is. If an atheist was caught in this dilemma, if a Buddhist or a Muslim, or we would corner them and laugh at them and say, ha, 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 us Christians, we've got the truth, you've got error. But when it's done we, me as a Christian, I'm talking to other people who are claiming to be Christians, saying, look, this Bible is the most accurate. And I'm just pointing out these glaring contradictions, glaring errors, blasphemous errors, blasphemous. The blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is that you, sh you know, <laughs> Jesus isn't allowed to um, to consider being equal with God, something to be grasped. No, he didn't consider robbery to be equal with God. Um, and yeah, this modern modern rendering is just strange, it's bizarre, and it's blasphemous. So let me just read that again. The Pharisees did not believe that he had any right to consider equality with God something to be grasped. That's what the Pharisees thought. That's exactly what the New American Standard Bible says. How strange is that? So this was the attitude of those who had blasphemed the Holy Ghost 2,000 years ago. And this is the exact attitude that the corrupted modern Bible versions convey today. It's the same flavor. It leads down the same path. Um... Low thoughts about Jesus Christ inevitably lead to the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. Inevitably, and once one has crossed that line, uh, is there any real turning back? I mean, I've read that verse, you know, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, and people are like, oh, I think I've committed it. And I've always said, look, I think if, you, if, you, if your heart's still soft to God and you, you're worried about that you've committed, you probably haven't. I think it's those people who are like, I haven't committed the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Um, I'm right with God, no matter what anyone says, no matter what, no matter all the evidence against me, I'm right. You know, <laughs> and that's what I find with with some of these people I'm dealing with. It's like they're they're correct, no matter what. They're, they're um, you know, here we clearly see that this is akin to the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Um, but it doesn't matter who would show them, and see, um. You could you could get you know, five hundred of the best 
linguists in the world to sit around and show them. And they would still, in the back of their mind, just disagree with it. And so we see that the Pharisees were in front of Christ. And Jesus said, you know, I and the Father are one. And they picked up, they're picking up stones. They want to kill him. Jesus himself could say it to these modern version uh, proponents, these people who defend the modern Bibles. Jesus could come down in a dream or in like, like he did with with. You imagine they're on their way to do a translation. They're in their car and Jesus just turns up in front of them on the road. And they're, they're blinded and he's they're like, what, what Lord? He's like, Why are you blaspheming the Holy Spirit? Why are you translating the Bible this way? But even then, they deny it. Because these, these guys had Jesus in front of them. And they, were, they wanted all the more to kill him. <laughs> they're just, they, they are against Christ. So this is the true spirit of religion. I mean, I understand Jehovah's Witnesses, Jonestown, Waco, all this other stuff. Yeah, you can look at cults. Some of the biggest religious freaks are those who are closest to the truth. Some of the biggest religious freaks, they're the ones proclaiming true doctrine, but they're not saved. Now, that's scary. When you meet someone who has true doctrine... But the, your spirit's going, something's wrong here. <laughs> something's not right. You know what I mean? And so what you find, these people, oh, the, the Trinity, you know, we do, James White, I defend the Trinity. I've written a book about the Trinity and all this stuff. And it's like, but there's just, you know, there's something not right there. And then he'll defend these verses. He was a consultant on the New American Standard Bible. He would have looked at this verse. And I read his book last night uh, on this section. And I was like, his, his answer was just fluff. It just... It wasn't anything. He just basically said King James Version people have a problem with this verse and they shouldn't. So, it will be found on the great day of judgment that the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost begins in the soul as a tiny seed. A seed whereby the soul begins to entertain thoughts. Nothing serious at first, just small thoughts even fleeting thoughts, thoughts about Jesus Christ, which chip away at Jesus Christ's majesty and his rightful claim to the title of Almighty God, thereby denying his identity as that one and the same Jehovah of the Old Testament, a denial that the corrupt modern Bibles perpetuate in Philippians chapter 2, verse 6, but we can also see that in Mark chapter 11, verse 3, John chapter 1, verse 18, and we can go on forever. Small declarations, which one by one chip away at Jesus Christ's rightful claim to the title, God was manifest in the flesh, which is, you know, another verse that we could go into, but we won't today. Um, but this is the strongest verse proclaiming Jesus Christ's deity. God was manifest in the flesh. No, we'll just make it who appeared in the body. <laughs> um, bizarre. But people are defending this. People, they can't see the Unitarian influence that uh, occurred. Um, how can you defend a reading that is against the Greek, causes a contradiction? It's the same blasphemy that the Pharisees committed by saying that you, Jesus, you can't um, con consider, you know, deity as something to be grasped. And Chrysostom clearly said was an Arian reading. And other people have agreed, you know, we've read it, other people, they've agreed with that. And so all the evidence, everything is against this reading. It's like, um, why defend this reading? So the very next verse uh, in the Corrupted Modern Bibles promotes... Uh, the whole concept of kenosis, the theory that Jesus emptied himself and put away his deity rather than made himself of no reputation, as the King James Version says. But that's a whole nother video. It's a whole nother uh, topic, you know, kenosis. You'll find a lot of people in uh, um, hyper-charismatic, uh, hyper-Pentecostal, Bethel Church, uh, Toronto, Vineyard Churches, they, they will follow this type of thing. And so uh, the kenosis where Jesus sort of um, he emptied himself of his godhood, where 
Um, I, you know, I teach that Jesus, um, he, he veiled his godhood, but and he could have called down to our legions of angels, but didn't. Where some people like, no, he was totally, he couldn't do that. And so, yeah, he, he, I believe he, in every situation, he could have, you know, just, just had laser beams coming out of his eyes and just turned into God, you know, and thunder and lightning and all this sort of stuff. But he restrained himself because he wanted to be an example for the believers of how you could live fully as as a man, even though he was God, 100% God, 100% man. You could live fully as a man as an example. So he didn't need to be baptized. He'd never sinned. He never had an example of sin that he had to get rid of or anything. But he said, "Let it be. Let it be so now to fulfill all righteousness." You know. So he was doing this as an example. So even though he knew he was sinless, he's like, "Let's just do this anyway." Because people are going to follow my example. And so then people who really were sinners, they were doing this as, um, as an allegory, you know, of, you know, they've, they've got this new life and everything like that. And so, uh, but we could go into that uh, another time. So basically, I just want to read these verses again. So we're sort of sticking on verse six here, because I just want to nail this. So King James Version totally agrees with the context of the Bible. And um, we, as uh, Texas Receptors, King James people, we believe that there's a rule that we submit ourselves to the Word of God. And whatever the Bible says about itself, we believe. If the Bible says it's without contradiction, we believe that. If the Bible says it will not fade away, we believe that. We don't just make up stuff about it, you know, on, from the outside looking in. We, we look at what the Bible says about itself. And we believe that. So that's why, you know, Luke 2.22, we don't believe it's a contradiction there. It's the woman who got purified. It's it's basic, you know. So um, people like Theodore Beezer, people like, um, like Stephanus, they, they understood these things. And they used these concepts, biblical concepts, in their, um, in their text criticism. So listen to this. King James Version, who being in the form of God, Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He's saying, I am the father of one. You know, um, Thomas is saying, my Lord and my God. You know, he's, he's not rebuking him. He's saying, that's right. Um, you know, he's saying, you've seen me, you've seen the father. I am the son. You know, and that's usually the son is an exact representation of the father eventually they grow up to be like that so that they were saying you the, the, they were saying you make yourself equal with god um, by saying these things so obviously he was causing them to think this these things he was saying these things to cause them to think these things but listen to the nasb who though he he existed sorry who although he existed in the form of god did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. <laughs> and you see now, it goes against the basic teaching of the Gospels. It goes against the Greek. It goes against um, basic Bible doctrine. Uh, it blasphemes the Holy Spirit because this is exactly what the Pharisees thought. Jesus um, you should not regard equality with God as something to be grasped or else we're going we're gonna to kill you. If you think you can make yourself equal with God, we are going to kill you. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I know uh, some people think I might be nasty or whatever, you know, doing videos like this. You know, but sometimes I just look at the state of these churches. I go into the Christian bookshop and there's wall to wall, New American Standard Bibles, ESVs. And I seriously, I challenge everyone, nearly every day, I challenge people. I will debate anyone in the world on these readings, on the things that I'm saying. I will, de I will debate anyone. 1 John 5, 7, Revelation chapter 16, verse 5, any verse that they choose. Just you know, give me a few weeks to prepare. I will debate anyone, anywhere. You set it up and I'll do it. And the reason that I say that is because... I've looked at these verses for many, many years now, and I just laugh at how dumb these Bibles are. But it saddens me that people, especially new people, come into the churches and this is what they're eating. This is what they're drinking. This is their spiritual nourishment. They're getting confusion. 
if someone sat there and said, hang on, um, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. And then thinking about the Gospels and going, hang on, but he did. And then going, hang on, that's exactly what the Pharisees accused him of, that he said, if you continue in this, you're blaspheming the Holy Spirit. That's heavy. And that's not even an issue in the Greek. It's not even an issue in, in a difference in the Greek. That's just translational methodology. So anyway, we're going to leave it there. I just thought I'd give a bit of a shout out to who I got this information from. I read through uh, Scott Jones' uh, his article. Um, and I read through Will Kinney and Skyne of Zion um, for the list of Bibles there. So thanks for joining us, guys. I'm going to upload this onto YouTube. I might even put a few fancy little pictures there just so to keep people's attention. But thanks for joining us, guys, and um, God bless you and have a good weekend.